An attack on the headquarters of Russia's Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. The ground war might be frozen, but the attacks are intensifying behind both Russian and Ukrainian lines. President Zelensky, now in Ottawa, is winning the argument. The Canadians will provide more. The US has just announced it will supply the long-range missiles Kiev so badly wanted. We'll get reaction. Also tonight, the Law Commission in England recommends rape trials be conducted without journalists or members of the public present in court. And in America, car workers are walking out in 20 states as talks with two of the biggest manufacturers collapse. Good evening. When Russia invaded Ukraine in February last year, the Ukrainian Navy was outnumbered 12 to 1 by the, the Russian Black Sea Fleet. They were not considered a meaningful force in any way. In the last 10 days, Ukraine has destroyed a Kilo-class submarine, one of only six that Russia operated in the Black Sea, a large landing ship that Russia planned to use for an amphibious landing in Odessa, a communication centre of the Russian Black Sea Fleet on the Crimean Peninsula, and today, they hit the fleet's main headquarters in central Sevastopol. The naval drones and missiles developed and adapted in Ukraine now target Russian ships in their own home ports. And that has eroded much of Russia's naval superiority. So much so that this past week, six commercial vessels have left Ukraine's main port of Odessa through a temporary corridor, two of them sailing with 20,000 tonnes of grain for Asian and African markets. And all of that without any permission being sought from Russia. Our correspondent in Kyiv, James Wardhouse, gave us the latest. This is clearly a continuation of Ukraine's tactic of specifically targeting sites in occupied Crimea. But the apparent direct hit of Russia's naval headquarters in Sevastopol is hugely symbolic. It's not yet clear what operational damage will be caused for Russia. But this is a place where it has exerted such dominance through its navy, where it launches missiles across Ukraine, it blockades Ukrainian ports. And I think what this attack does is undermine Russia's continued occupation in a place that's seen as a cornerstone of its invasion from as far back as 2014. There is also a connection between this missile strike and Ukraine's continued counteroffensive further north. What they are trying to do is frustrate Russian supply lines and isolate swathes of occupied territory in the hope that troops will run out of supplies. Now, President Zelensky has just completed a visit to the US. He's in Canada currently. And I think what we're seeing now is battlefield progress increasingly getting linked to the politics of it all. Because, yes, he is being warmly welcomed by both countries, but there are political corners that are growing increasingly sceptical as to what a Ukrainian victory might look like and as to for how long Western allies should be pumping billions of dollars into Ukraine. So it's becoming increasingly high stakes for President Zelensky, who's now having to do a fair bit of negotiating in his foreign policy. Well, let's speak to Mike uh, Mihilovich, who's a former member of the Yugoslav and Canadian Armed Forces and a weapons system specialist. He's joining me from Toronto in Canada. Uh, a very warm welcome to Good you. The, the fact Thank that you. the Ukrainians are even shipping grain from Odessa shows just how much the balance of power has shifted in the Black Sea. Would it be true to say now that uh, areas of the Black Sea are not safe for the Russian fleet? Uh, well, uh, shipping the the grain uh, or sending the commercial ships to, to certain routes, uh, it's uh, it's advantageous, advantageous for Ukraine, but it's not something that Russia actually interfere. Uh, they may do that in the near future, but uh, they simply don't see any any any, any reason to do that. Uh, so yeah, Ukraine is going to, to continue with the neutral uh, flag the ships, uh, but implication on the on the overall export or. Uh, and any uh, provoking any reaction of the Russian uh, Black Sea Fleet uh, is not 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 really significant uh, according to the. To but the it would current, be a, it uh, would be a gamble, though, wouldn't it? On the evidence of what's happened in the yeah. past ten days, to start moving Russian shipping through the Black Sea, given what they have in terms of the naval drones and the missiles, it would be now a gamble for the Russians, which, as I say, shows how far the game has shifted. Yes, because uh, the ships are uh, basically sailing through the Black Sea, but uh, Ukraine doesn't have any means to uh, to detect those those ships. So um, all uh, all uh, intelligence uh, 
uh, came from uh, and coming from NATO. So NATO has assets that will pinpoint uh, locations of the Russian ships so that uh, those uh, naval drones and um, aerial drones can be launched from the Ukrainian side. And also NATO is involved in the, in the guidance, uh, but more importantly, they, they are actually uh, following the positions and the uh, radar emissions of the Russian uh, air defense systems. And that, uh, regarding to this uh, uh, Sevastopol attack, uh, it is obvious that it, it was uh, supported by some means of electronic uh, intelligence uh, provided over the Romanian or Romanian uh, territorial waters uh, by the by the one of the NATO NATO planes. Um, can we talk about uh, what's going on in Ottawa at the moment? In fact, we're seeing pictures mm -hmm. of the uh, mm -hmm. podium where the two leaders, uh, Justin Trudeau and President Zelensky, mm -hmm. will appear. We've had a, a commitment today from the Canadians, three, three years of aid. That includes more fighting vehicles, more training for F-16 pilots. And there is speculation tonight on NBC in the United States that the White House is going to green light the supply of the longer range missiles, the attackums. If that were to be true, and we're still waiting for a second source on that, what sort of a game changer would that be? Mm -hmm. Okay, first, regarding to Canada, Canada already shipped uh, whatever was available because the Canadian Armed Forces, uh, uh, here we, uh, we face uh, shortages. There is a lot of equipment which is not uh, in operational conditions. So, for instance, we shipped, I think, 12 uh, Leopard tanks, uh, some um, light armor vehicles, a lot of uh, rifles, uh, infantry, infantry weapons, also Carl Gustav uh, anti-tank uh, launchers. But bear in mind, those... There is a, uh, a very, very questionable conditions of that equipment. When you mention F-16, uh, training F-16 pilots, Canada doesn't uh, operate F-16. So uh, Canada can give uh, some kind of general training, uh, flying training, but uh, uh, contribution to F-16 is, will be mm, simply zero because we simply don't have that. We have F-18, F which is not, not still on, on the list, of, but... Uh, I will not exclude that uh, in the near future some of Canadian um, available Canadian planes uh, may be shipped. Yeah. Uh, the regarding to the uh, ballistic missiles, uh, according to some of my information, uh, some of them are already in Ukraine. Those they, they were stationed in in the Western Europe. Um, uh, the number you are talking about limited number, but nobody specified that number. Bear in mind, those missiles are old ones. Ukraine now possess much much stronger weapons. It's, uh, that is. Uh, Storm Shadow or Scalp, uh, French version, they have HIMARS. Uh, ballistic missiles, AT, um, ATACMS or ATACMS, uh, they're easy, they're much easier to, to engage because they have ballistic trajectory. So Russia has a means to do that. They, they have uh, uh, anti-ballistic missile systems available. So uh, in my opinion, there is nothing going to change. Ukraine may be able to launch a couple of them and maybe even score some, some hits, but in overall progress, yeah. What they need, Ukraine. Ukraine need to need to achieve some success on the battlefield, and battlefield is now bogged down because Ukraine is suffering terrible casualties since this morning. More than 500 uh, casualties all uh, through the whole front line, uh, and uh, few few ballistic missiles, even 100 ballistic missiles, uh, it can't change anything. Yeah, uh, but then, like you say, they they do have the storm shadow, uh, and, and you would yes. think it, it was cruise missile. We think that was fired at the headquarters, yes. the naval headquarters in Sevastopol today. What I just wondered, just before I let you go, what does that actually say about the Russian air defence systems, the S four hundred, the S three hundred systems, which were they were much feared before the war started? And they are. They're they're the best systems in the world. Uh, I will well, tell not you that this. good. <laughs> no, no, no. They. Uh, Please, please be be realistic. Yeah. Those systems are uh, are um, uh, proven. What is important? Uh, you uh, NATO provide Ukrainian with information. They are NATO locating the mission of uh, Rus Russian raiders. NATO is pinpointing uh, um, uh, locations of the individual uh, launchers, individual uh, fire control systems. Then NATO planners, uh, in cooperation with uh, with the Ukrainian forces, they are doing planning for the, for the attack. Everything is information. Ukraine doesn't have means to uh, to do anything. Without NATO, Ukraine simply can't do anything. Uh, uh, Russia, uh, implication of this attack is more symbolic. It is slamming to the face. But Ukraine will uh, achieve much more if they simply destroyed, uh, uh, let's say, BM-21 or Grad uh, multiple uh, launch rocket system or even Smerch. Because uh, those systems are the ones that hammering Ukrainian troops uh, uh, in, in the field, hitting the building. No, no matter how spectacular that is, yeah, for the for the PR stunts, for the for the marketing, uh, for for a morale, it's excellent. It's, mm -hmm. it's a slam into the Russian face, 
but a strategic or tactical implication is zero. And um, uh, on the Russian side, people now starting to call uh, for the retaliatory um, attacks so that, uh, let's say, uh, destroy the Ukrainian bridges uh, over Dnieper or destroy infrastructure. Russia is not, not doing that stuff for now. But we will see. I mean, uh, this war is not going to finish anytime soon. Well, it certainly makes a statement, doesn't it? Uh, Mike Mihailovich, good to talk to you. Thank you very much uh, for You're that. Um, You're looking there at pictures of uh, the situation in Ottawa, where, say, President Zelensky and uh, Justin Trudeau are soon uh, to appear. Justin Trudeau's pledged nearly $500 million in aid to Ukraine uh, today during uh, this meeting. And that, of course, hard on the heels of the whirlwind tour of the United States uh, from Monday through Wednesday. Um, this afternoon, as you can see there, he received a series of standing ovations as he addressed Canadian lawmakers, an honour that he was refused yesterday by Republicans in Washington. In his speech, Mr Zelensky praised the country's commitment to defending freedom and said Ukraine would never give up. Ukraine and Canada are the same. We stand and we fight for life. Ukraine, not genocide, will be victorious in this war. People will be the winners, not the Kremlin. Freedom will be the winner. Justice will be the winner. You can know this for sure about us, because you know for sure about yourself that you would never submit to evil. Important trip this for President Zelensky, given that some of the Allies are wavering. We saw that in Congress yesterday, particularly on the Republican side. But some encouraging news emerging tonight from Brussels. There are reports from several sources now that the European Commission is about to recommend membership talks begin with Ukraine in earnest. And once the Commission makes that recommendation, then EU leaders will be asked to sign off on it, most likely at their summit meeting in December. Uh, let's talk to RFERL's Europe editor, Ricard uh, Josviak. He's uh, in Prague. Did I pronounce your surname right? Josviak, is that right? Yeah, perfectly right. I can see that. A lucky, a lucky stab in the dark. Um, um, so talk to me about this, because obviously it's all rumour and speculation at the moment, but there are a number of sources now saying the Commission has made a decision. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, they are about to make that sort of decision. They recognise, of course, that Ukraine have made uh, sufficient enough progress in these sort of recommendations that the Commission set out a year ago. So uh, that, that will happen. It will come with a sort of enlargement report in uh, the end of October, most likely, where they will recommend that Ukraine and Moldova will start accession talks. Um, another reason for that is simply as well that it's not only in America you'll have big election next year, you'll have it in Europe as well. So it's a sense sort of like 2023 is the time to sort of clear the decks and move ahead and offering Ukraine this possibility is, is symbolic low-hanging fruit that uh, the EU feels that it can offer. Yeah, huge morale booster for the Ukrainians, of course. But the reason the Commission was slow-walking th this was naturally because Ukraine's borders are compromised, as is the case with Georgia and Moldova. So if they're prepared to accept Ukraine, what does that mean for the rest? And, and what has changed in, in, in the thinking within the Commission? Yeah, of course... Uh, Offering uh, accession talks doesn't mean that Ukraine will become a member today. It will take years, this. I know that Ukraine wants to fast-track this and that they will become a member very soon. That will not happen. So right now, this is a, a sort of a, you could call it a light at the end of the tunnel, that, listen, you know, we want you to be part of the European family, but this is just the very start of some very difficult negotiations that will go on. So, uh, yes, Countries at war right now, they have lots of problems otherwise as well, economic problems, uh, problems with corruption. No one is denying that. But it is that sort of carrot that the EU feels it can offer, uh, knowing full well that this is a process that will take time. And hopefully, I mean, that's the hopeful scenario for, for, for the West or for Brussels as, as well, is that by the time Ukraine might be ready to join, that they control most of their sovereign territory. And I wonder as we say in Britain, whether we're putting the chicken before the egg, because before you can accept an expanded Europe and uh, a union of over 30 countries, you have to reform the way the European Union operates. And there is an enormous debate to be had about how the rules would work. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think you discussed uh, on BBC yesterday this Franco-German paper uh, that talks about these sort of reforms that has to be made, and they're enormous. Um, 
for example, I mean, just such a simple thing as uh, making sure how many MEPs you will have. It's already you know, more than 700. Will that be increased? Will it stay the same? How many commissioners will you have? It's already 27. That's way too many already. But most importantly, these sort of things, how to make efficient decisions. Because right now in the European Union, uh, most things in the council, where the member state sits, is still done by unanimity. And that slows things down. So to move that towards some sort of majority voting will be an enormous task that probably need uh, treaty change. And we know full well from history what it means when you have treaty change in the European Union. That usually means referenda in some countries. We've seen that in Ireland, we've seen that in the Netherlands, we've seen it in France. And those referenda are not easy to win. So this is a monumental task for the European Union. Just one quick one before I let you go. Would it be a universe, would it be universally accepted within the European Council among 27 leaders if it was put to them in December? My indication is that it will. I think the country to look out for is obviously Hungary. Yeah. They have a slightly different view on Ukraine compared to others. And do they have so a they veto? Have this, I mean, on, on they a, do on have a veto. Absolutely. They do. Okay. Absolutely, they do have a veto. But what's always happening at, in, in Brussels is an exciting place at the end of December with lots of horse trading. And as we know, uh, Hungary needs money, um, EU money that uh, has been frozen for Hungary. So I can see a quid pro quo happening there just before Christmas. Rika, really interesting reporting. Thank you for coming on and telling us about it this evening. Good to see you. Uh, those are the pictures live from Ottawa. We'll try and dip into a little bit of that when the two leaders appear. But at the moment, uh, they're all on standby um, and uh, it could be uh, some time yet. So we'll bring that to you when we see it.